my upbringing was designed for me to go to the penitentiary to the graveyard. You know what I'm saying? Right. So when I overcame it, you know what I mean? It was just like, I, was ex- I wasn't excited for the money. I'm still not excited for the, the, the fortune and the house. And, you know what I'm saying? I thank God every day I have a house over my head that I can call mine, but at the same time, it's like, I beat the eyes. You know what I'm saying? Like, every black my brother in jail right now, you know what I'm saying? My only big brother, he looking at 30 years. And I'm like, damn how the tables turn so fast, but it's it's like nobody cares. Not that nobody cares, but it's just like, that's what was designed for him, you know what I'm saying? Like- Different story, different background. Today I got my brother, Pro Bowl, Atlanta Falcon Safety, William Moore, aka Willie Moore, aka Wi Fi Willie. Yes, yes, you want to go by yes, the time. I'm calling him both, and that's why I met him at. So, um, man, this dude, uh, we got drafted together 2009, second round pick for the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, man, awesome story. Uh, you know, definition of the team. Uh, it's the highest point, the most powerful, the most successful. And I can tell you, this guy has an amazing story. Um, real humble beginners. And right now, you know, we at his house right now in this studio. We're going to get into his music stuff later. But somebody who really, I mean, to be honest, got it out of the mud, came from the dirt, and uh, changed his life, changed his family's life, um, set us up financially. Probably, I can say, probably didn't imagine he ever get to this, get to this point um, from where he started from. That's enough about me. Uh, Mo, Haytown, Missouri. I didn't even know what Haytown was when I met you. We got on the plane the first day of uh, mini camp. We was in the limo headed from the airport up to Flowery Branch. I don't know if you remember that. I remember every time. You remember that? Yeah. Man, let everybody know, man. Haytown, Missouri, with we story stuff. Haytown, Mo, baby. Shout out Haytown, Mo. Uh, Haytown, Mo, small town, man. Uh, I think we're closer to Memphis. Uh, but right by St. Louis, you know what I'm saying? So I grew up with St. Louis Cardinals fan, St. Louis, St. Louis Rams fan, greatest show on earth, you know what I'm saying? So uh, small town population, shit, probably like, I can't even say, probably somewhere like a thousand or something like that. Yeah. Tight knit community, you know what I'm saying? Uh, football was everything in there, you know what I mean? So uh, I grew up playing ball, bro. I, I grew up Pee Wee football, playing ball, you know what I mean? So it's always been in my life. So. Grandma raised me, you know what I'm saying, Miss Hattie Mo. She was like, my grandma was like the grandma, you know, that grandma who cooked for everybody, door always open. Uh, so that's hey time Mo, man. You know, I think, I think the thing I like the most about playing in the league and then just meet, you know, you get to meet people from, man, every which way walk of life, you know, within one day, you know, you, I guess we had that time, second round was on the second day of the draft. Second, third, and fourth. So, you know, we didn't even know, but we both get a phone call that day. We end up probably in the city. We probably never thought we ever we ever be in. Right. We sitting on the back of this limo, headed up, you know, the flowery branch. We didn't know what a flowery branch was. You know what I'm saying? And you mean, you know, I'm real, you know, I'm real good on reading people, man. I'm just, you know, even though I come off as anti-social, you know, I kind of, I can, you know, I can be friend related to anybody. I meet this dude, man. Only thing I know about Missouri, I think you might be the only person I know that's from Missouri, actually. Right, right. And the only thing I know is St. Louis Lunatics. So I meet this dude, he's on Alpha Haytown. Man, but you know what, though? 
I got this, I got like the spiritual gift of discernment and I can kind of read people and man, when we don't get into it, I can just feel, but the first time I met you, and we talk about this now, and probably won't talk deeper than we ever talked about the four years we played with each other. Man, right, and you got a tattoo on your arm, thing. And you can carry it with you by the way you play, the way you move, and you know sometimes you can just sense, you can sense, I can sense it back in the background. Uh, and, uh, and man, it's awesome because I mean, even now, even you know how you, how you play, how you play the game, how you live your life. You can just tell something that you never let go. Second tattoo you got, which I know is the first time I mentioned in Missouri. I don't, I don't even know if the arm was fully sleeved out at that time. But no, it was sure, real, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I knew. I also knew you were proud. You know, what I'm saying you were proud. You know, what I'm saying to be from Missouri. But one thing I do know, um, I know everything one piece of the cream when you grew up. And, uh, you know, just talk about, you know, your childhood, some of the stuff that you may have gone through and then, you know, your experience with being adopted. And uh, eventually, you know, it's kind of different being adopted. So white family, uh, you know, going to high school, before you want to call, talk about that for a little bit. You know, a lot of African-American brothers, we all grew up the same. You hear these similar stories of growing up in poverty and, you know what I'm saying, growing up with less opportunities. And, that, and it's like a, that's like a cliche from all, you know what I'm saying, yeah. brothers these days. We've all raised up in those environments. And uh, I'm one of those type of brothers who I don't idolize being from the hood. Shit, I want one day to say, I'm, you know, get up out of there and not look back, you know what I'm saying? So I, I see this generation right here, they idolize. All from the streets, I'm from the hood, whoop, whoop. I'm, I'm in these streets, I'm a street cat, whoop, whoop. But that's not, that's, that's nothing to glorify, you know what I'm saying? Because I always said, when you make it out, you don't even want to look back to that, you know what I'm saying? So me personally, man, I'm, a, I'm the baby of four, you know what I'm saying? My mom, she had four, five kids. My oldest brother died before I was born, so I'm the baby of five. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, my mom, I don't know my father. So uh, my mom, she, you know, dealt with drug addiction, crack, you know, she, from the era of my 80s baby, you know what I'm saying? Anybody know 80s baby, you know, the whole crack era, whatever. You know what I'm saying? My mom been on crack since I was born, you know what I'm saying? Thank God I wasn't affected by it. I don't think I was. But, um, you know, when I was young, I still remember I was the only one really around my mom due to me being the baby, you know what I'm saying? My oldest brother was gone, my sister was my older sister was gone, and I got another sister around, you know, two or two years older than me. So we was it was just me and her around. It was one point my mom was just like really out there bad, you know what I'm saying? And uh, it's one 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 scene that I play in my mind all the time is when my mom, you know, she was, uh, you know, I always knew when my mom was, you know, high or whatever, because you just, I could smell the smell of crack from miles away, you know what I'm saying? It's a stinking ass smell. But uh, my mom was high at one point, and I told her about this. Like, my mom was the nicest when she was high. You know what I'm saying? I used to, like, like, mom, can I use the car? If she wouldn't hide, she'd be like, hell no, you can't use my car. If she would hide, she'd eat anything that. So it got to the point that I like when she was hot and it's fucked up and I thought that way, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I, here today, I feel like I was wrong for that, you know what I'm saying? I used to catch it when she was hot, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So when I smell the smell of crack, I asked her for everything in the world because I know she, she didn't put in her right mind to say anything. But when I was seven years old, I started playing a uh, little league baseball and I played for uh, Lenny Carty and, and Bank of, Bank of Paytime. That was uh, the name of my little baseball team. So every day after practice, I would walk home through a graveyard. We stayed in apartments. I had to walk through a graveyard to get home. And keep in mind, I'm young as hell. So my little league baseball coach saw me walking, and he was like, I guess, you know, he asked his wife, who played the game, my guy. Uh, he asked him, like, he be walking home every day by himself. They saw me walk through the graveyard. And uh, so one day after practice, it was like, we never. You know what I mean? We're gonna drop you off at home. So uh, they they put me in a truck. I remember sitting on my godmom's lap, and they took me home. And on the way home, we almost ran over this this drunk lady that was laying in the road. And thank God, I was sitting on my godmom's lap. I could see down. I said, "Hey, somebody's laying in the road." And they stopped. And keep in mind, this was uh this was in the apartments that I was living in. So this was like like uh, introduction to where I was living in. So they pull up to my house. 
And uh, it's late at night, 10 o'clock. And I go to the house and nobody's there. And uh, they, they walk into my door. Nobody's there. And it was like, you okay staying by yourself? Like, do it all the time. And going in, he flipped the lights with, you know, lights, you know, my mom, the lights were gone. So I remember going in and no lights. And he was just like, what are you doing here? I was like, I'm here every night with no lights on. You know what I'm saying? This is normal. And uh, so he was like, no, you're staying with us tonight. And I ended up going to my doctor friend's house and the rest was history. Uh, they, they just, you know what I mean? God bless, thank God so much for those people, man. Their last name is the Whites. So if you ever hear me say the Whites, it's not because they're white people, it's because their last name is the Whites. Yeah, so, real quick. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so they really took a liking to me, and I thank God for them. They, they've been there for me my whole entire life, man. And, uh, they've been such a blessing from God. And uh, I don't know where I'd be without I definitely wouldn't be where I'm at right now without them. Yeah, shout out to the And so look, all right. So. They adopt you. And um what's the name at the high school again? Hey to high school. Hey to high school. obviously we know you was a stand. I actually read you was a receiver. Yeah. For sure. Man, I you receiver then you know these hands. You, you I mean I, I, these know, hands. I know I know you got I know I know you made plays on the football, but I was reading, I'm like, dang, I mean, I only know you as you know, we about to talk about your, your time in the zoo. Right. And just, you know, being in college, I I you know I see this physically imposing big safety win number one. And y'all had a squad too. Yeah. I'm sitting back looking yeah. at it. Yeah. I'm gonna take people who really didn't know Sean off top. You got Chase Call on the tight end. Mm-hmm. Dog Mac Award winner, right? Oh, there you go. Mac Award winner, Ziggy, mm-hmm. Spoon, you yeah. had Spoon mm-hmm. out there, you, and uh, I know you said Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Magnus mm-hmm. and the six now he's still he's right. still getting right. 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 he's still yeah. so I had him. So like, you know, talk about that, you know. After being adopted, I'm obviously I know you know you probably got on track for the most of the track you ever been. What made you choose Missouri? I mean, I know you was a dog. I know you had I know you had other options. Right. Again, the hence the tattoo, you know, loyal to Missouri. So I've always been a Missouri fan. Even I got a picture when I was young. I had the throwback Missouri um Tigers uh, sweater. Yeah. So I've always been a Missouri Tiger fan growing up and uh I was one of the earliest commits. I committed as a junior. I always knew where I wanted to go. And I remember uh, the coach, Coach Eva Blues, he's the head coach down in um, He's the head coach now. And um, he came to a basketball game in my high school. And the whole time, I'm thinking I'm going to get you know, recruited to play basketball. Yeah. And he was just coming to the basketball game to just see my athletic ability. So uh, I'm showing out. I'm dunking and shit. You know what I'm saying? And I'm the whole time thinking I'm going to play basketball. So I'm trying to. Do the most, you know what I mean? But uh, that was the first time this dude showed up to offer me a scholarship. And I knew I had, like I said, I was the second commit after Missouri, Missouri, University of Missouri is in Columbia, Missouri. And the first commit was a kid named Van Alexander who was from Columbia. So he committed first and I committed second. So um, I had Arkansas, Oklahoma, Tennessee. I had all these schools, but I now went on one trip and that was University of Missouri. I knew I was going there from day one. Yeah. You well well obviously yeah. I, Did you have him? I had yeah. Ole Miss, Arkansas, Tennessee. Um the only it was one offer I said if they would have offered me, that was the only school I was going to, and that was Miami. But y'all yeah. weren't in the SEC at that point. No, we no. were in Big Twelve. Big Twelve. Big Twelve. That's great. In junior season, I'm gonna tell you so obviously, you know, at Richmond one double A we you know everybody we always looking to see what everybody else is doing. But look man, you know, you're saying there's no I'm saying you know, Right. No, no, any single digit number, you know what they're on. Right, right, you right. gotta be. I'm saying number one, I, mean, I, I wore a number two, so you know I had to be doing something. I'm saying the number one, this dude, man, six one, all the two. They saying 230, but I'm like, <laughs> you know, we know he wore the 230, like, dog, he can run. Then we was talking about, you know, you know, statistically, what you did uh, at the school. You had know, eight picks. Um, so, you know, obviously, you know, they got the pass to the draft, they, NFL Network, they're projecting what's going to happen. You know, I happen to follow the head and I'm watching, and obviously they talk about you're going to be a first rounder, but then, you know, they talk about your senior, your senior season, because you missed a, you missed right. a bunch of games due to, due to injury. Mm-hmm. You know, let's talk about um, that season, maybe, you know, trials, tribulations, maybe how frustrating it was going into the draft, because I'm sure you thought, I mean, everybody, anybody watching college football thought you were going to go in the first round, even though going in the second was a blessing, but right. talk about that a little bit. So that was one of the most frustrating times for me uh, due to, I didn't feel like 
I thought for myself, uh, because as a junior, I had the opportunity to leave as a junior, you know that. Um, and that, that that's one of those things that a lot of kids these days wouldn't understand. Uh, at the time, you know, they had a mock draft. So yeah. at the time, I was top 10, you know what I mean, the first second got the board. College from college and in the field, they give you your true projection of where they think you might go. So when I called in, they said I might go third, fourth round. And that played a lot into me coming back to school. So, uh, again, I promised to my godparents, the whites, that I graduated from, high, graduated from college. And that's, you know, and that, that was something that was number one on my resume to graduate from college for them. You know what I mean? But looking back at it, I mean, obviously now it's 15 years later, I was just like, I probably would have left this gym, you know what I mean? Because when you, now that I understand NFL, how it works and uh, contracts and all that, I probably should have left this gym. It would have been best. But I'm a true believer in God and how he works and how things align. Um, I wouldn't have never met you, you know what I'm saying? I wouldn't have never been in Atlanta. I wouldn't have never had my children, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, everything planned worked out for you know, the best, so I feel like I made the best move. Well, now look, <clears throat> perfect segue to talking about getting drafted. We were just listening, you know, we listened to some of your music before we got started, and you showed me the video, Good Vibes. I took this one line up that quick. You said, it took me 22 years to make my mama proud. If all the things didn't draft me, I'd still be out here running wild. How the game of football saved your life? Yeah, shit, it saved my life all the way, man. I owe everything to the game of football. Uh, I had a talk with my son about three days ago because he's my son is ten years old. He's playing football now, but he went through the he went through the whole thing of he didn't want to play football because he felt like I pressured him to play. And so he was like, I don't have to play football dad. So I realized I was fortunate on him at one point. And then I stepped back and said, Son, one day you will realize this game of football has it's the reason you're born. You know what I'm saying? And I told him. I said, you owe this much to the game of football because everything that you have is from the game of football. And that's how much I owe to the game of football. And I don't know where I'd be without the game of football because, I mean, if you do anything, any backtrack on where I come from, I hate time. But, you know, I did a year in juvenile uh, in the boys' home when I was young. I used to do the most stupidest thing, man. You know, I used to break in houses, steal, rob, anything you can possibly think. Uh, and one thing that played back when I was telling you, my mom's house was the, I don't, the crack house, basically the spot. So, uh, you know, all the crackheads, well, I don't want to say crackheads, but the people who smoke come to my mom's house, you know, say it was the spot. So it got to the point where I started sitting on the couch and just people passed me. And it got to the point where I used to see important people, you know what I'm saying? People that I used to see you know, they had to play the part in the school or they was in the community. They'd come in the house and be like, what's up, Will? I'd be like, what's going on? Then they'd just go to the back where, you know what I mean? Where yeah, they were smoking. Yeah, you know, and I didn't know, know, right? And I was like, damn, I never knew he smoked. You know what I mean? And uh, so my mom, found, I went fast forward a little bit. I started selling, you know, crack at uh, the age of probably like 14, 15. I started down. And uh, my mom found that I was selling and her exact words, she was like, if you're going to do it, I'm going to show you how to do it. You know what I mean? And make sure you do it right so you don't kind of get caught up in those you know, nonsense. So I remember her sending me, you know, I always sit on the couch, watch TV when they walk through. So it got to the point where my mom knew I had, you know, my little packs. So I sit and serve all the people who come. So they didn't have to leave the house, you know what I'm saying? So uh, my mom told me how to cook it, you know what I mean? And all that. And, uh, the worst thing out of that whole experience is something that played back in my mind all the time. I wish that I could change is uh, homecoming was coming up in high school and uh, it was about three in the morning on a school night and my mom knocked on the door and she come in and she asked, you know, she wanted a dub. The dub is, you know, she went out of the rock. And I am like, you know, I'm not selling you no, no drugs. I ain't doing it. She was like, son, I remember the exact words. She said, son, I'm going to get him somewhere. And I was like, you got to get him somewhere. I'm not selling to you. And she said, don't you need some money for the homecoming? And I was like, yeah, but I'm, you know, I'm straight. So I swore. Um, I don't know. How, how, how did that affect you?
direction in that moment. Yeah, yeah. I know. I, I see you replaying. I like. I'm saying like you looking, just replaying your mind. How does how it affect you? It affects me here today. You know what I'm saying? Because uh, I never finished. You know, finished what I was saying. So I ended up telling her. I was like, just get it, mom. It's in the top drawer. She ended up getting it. And get it. You know. Then I told myself that I didn't sell it to her, so I was okay with it. But here today, I'm like. I shouldn't, you know what I'm saying? I shouldn't have told her where it was at because I basically sold it to her, you know what yeah. I'm saying? And that shit haunt me all the time, you know what I mean? I, that's one of those regrets that I feel like it, I couldn't do anything different because that was the circumstances I was in, you feel what I'm saying? So uh, that was that was real damaging to my whole, you know what I'm saying? My, my whole thought process of like, damn, my mom buying crack from me now, you know what I'm saying? And uh, I really was, uh, what he called it, I was discouraged as a child. I mean, not a child, but this is my teenage years. And I was discouraged in my teenage years from, uh, we used to have parent-teacher conference. And my mom never showed up, you know what I mean? And did the teacher, I was, and keep my mom bad as hell in high school. So the teachers was like, your mom need to come. Yeah. And so they called her directly for her to come. And I remember like yesterday, my mom came Keep in mind, I told you earlier, I'm probably the only one that knows when my mom is hot. Yeah. So my mom showed up to the uh, parent teacher conference and she was high as shit, jumping, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I'm sitting there looking at her, I felt it was so embarrassed, and I'll never forget it. I was so embarrassed, but thank God nobody else knew that yeah. she was high, you know what I'm saying? But I never really forgave her for that, you know what I'm saying? Like, damn, mom, you can wait an hour to go do your thing, you know what I'm saying? But those were the things that really like messed my mental up. Like, damn, she didn't care enough about me to like hold off for two hours and, you know what I'm saying, come here and come here in the house. So, how do you think, how do you, my thoughts, how do you think that the time for the message you would take outside of you saying you feel bad, but like, and at now, with the time 30, 37 now, you're talking about some teenage, that's what, 20, 22, 23 years ago now at this point? Still replaying it like it was just like it was yesterday. And sometimes that's how we that's how all trauma and bad stuff yeah, absolutely is. Like you think about it, it's like it's like you feel like how you felt right now is how you felt when you was 14, 15 sitting in the conference. Right. But that, that also gave me motivation to be a parent I am today, you know what I'm saying? Good, bro. Um, that's how I am that's why I'm like that with my kids. I'm supposed to protect them, you know what I'm saying, which is a good and a bad thing, but at the same time I never let them go through things I went through. And me and my mom relationship has gotten better, but you know, I always question that too due to my success. You know what I'm saying? Uh, my mom did drugs all the way through college. Keep in mind, never attended any games. You know what I'm saying? And I always held that against her and myself also. Right? No one ever really came to my games until I got to the NFL. Yeah, that's when it was at, at that point, you try to figure out. You, you know, know what I'm saying? saying? Yeah. Trying to out. Everybody deal with that in their own yeah. way. Yeah. I, I deal with that some as well, not in that circumstance, but we all trying to figure out like and I really I said it, but you know my school, I'm at Richmond, mm -hmm. we get we get five thousand people max at a game. Right. And you know, people not coming and my, my family was like some some not everybody, but some we ninety minutes, you know, hundred miles on the road and they won't come down, they won't come, but Oh shit, we coming to the A though. Right. We, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh, we come right. we gonna come to Atlanta. Sure. So yeah. People don't really, you know, on the outside don't really understand that. Mm -hmm. Um they don't really understand some what we go through sometimes when yeah, the light will, you know, it's like we the same person, but everybody else is looking at us different now. Right. I mean, and that's part of the game and that, that make you who you are, you know what I mean? And that uh we talked about it earlier. I feel like that's what made me adjust to uh, I held that over my head of being something that I wouldn't. I never was true to myself throughout my whole NFL career. I feel like I idled it down to meet the criteria of the NFL players. You know what I'm saying? I knew you was different. I, I think we, I don't know who it was during the all season or we first got it. We went to opera one night and we was in a way, you know how you, know, you said, you got to step to walk up. I know what you're talking about. But they got the bottom part right here when you come in. And we there is me and Spence. We were like, oh yeah, both about to pull up. Right. <laughs> hey man, this fool pull up with Gucci man, like old Gucci. <laughs> no, Gucci. Not new Gucci. Like right. that's sophisticated Gucci. We right. were like, oh Gucci. I'm like, this nigga just pulled up with Gucci. <laughs> that's my thought. Man, how did that how did that happen? I think you said y'all met at the jewelry store or something. Yeah. We was in the jewelry store at Marietta and uh we had the same jewelry and me and Gucci. We was 
and at the same time, he, he like what you do outside, play ball with the group. And I like come to a game, man. And he ended up coming to a game, and the rest of the history. It was uh, crazy because he came to a game one time, and uh, right after the game, he had a show at a club, cream. And so I got dressed. He jumped in the challenger with me, and we ended up going to the show. And it was just me and him going to the show. And by the time we got to the show, it was probably we stopped at the gas station. And he must somebody knew him from the east side. And we ended up having like 30 people with us by the time we put up to the club. And that's about the time it showed me the life of a rapper. You know what I'm saying? It was just us two going to the club. By the time we got there, it was probably 30 people with us. You know what I mean? So many people. We walked in there and people kept coming. But I was like, you know, still. And I'm like, you know, I'm, we, we all knew to being in Atlanta. I had a couple of teammates I was from um, Atlanta at Richmond. And right. they, I'm like, man, I play Atlanta music all day, every day. And they, you know, I saw them, we used to listen to Bricks all the time. So when you walked in with them, I'm like, oh, shit, that's good. You know what I'm saying? Goo up. You know what I mean? Right. That, was, that was a different experience then. Yeah. yeah, at that point, we don't get to the music part yet. Because you skipped over something, that's, which I want to talk about. But you got this. I'm looking at it right now. And I, I'm looking at your house and some of the stuff you got up. You got this. Bro, you got this, this thing with death, bro. The, the reason why you wore number 25. You get drafted, you wear number 25. Um, so this is actually a chance uh, for people to learn a little bit more about the people that have been in your life that, you know, passed on. You know, God bless their soul. But tell everybody why you wore number 25. I came from one of my teammates in Missouri. His name was Aaron O'Neill. He was, uh, we both got there at the same time. He was a rookie with a freshman. He was from St. Louis. And every day, we both stayed in the dorm at the same time. He was basically my roommate. He stayed in my room one time. And, uh, hey, I was the only uh, freshman with car. And so, uh, A.L. used to take my car all the time. He was like the only one that I trust to drive my car because he was, he was just a good kid. You know what I'm saying? Not, Discarding, disregarding everybody else, all the other people there. But hey, yo, was just a genuine, but just like yourself, I trust you to take my car anyway, you know what I'm saying? So uh, one day, AO, hey, we usually go to the uh, morning workouts, and AO hey, ended up going to the afternoon workout, and it was hot as hell, it was get hot, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So hot that you can see the waves in the field. And uh, AO hey, missed the, he didn't go to the morning workout. So by the time I get in class, the teacher like, where's Aaron O'Neill? I was like, damn, boy, A.O. So we went to the afternoon. And uh, by the time I leave class and go home and take a nap and get a call, and that's when everybody told me he had passed, you know what I'm saying? Like, well, he had passed, passed out. They didn't say he died yet. And that was just like, that was so life-changing. Of course, I lost a lot of people in my life, but A.O. probably was like one of the first that I've seen one second and gone the next. And he had so many dreams. Like we used to sit on the side of practice and I, you know what I'm saying? We red shirted together. That's right. So we used to talk about what we were going to do when we finally get the opportunity to play. And he never got the opportunity, man. And that, that, that really, really changed my life, bro. I looked at everything. And his dad, I told his dad when I got drafted that I'd be on him. Hey, yo, every second I'm in that field. So I fought for that number 25. Uh, from, uh, what's up? Who won? Yeah, yeah. You pay for it? Yeah, wait. Yeah, you pay for it? Yeah, I was donating uh, the five dollars to whatever charity he yeah. wanted. To, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, and that was important for me, man. And uh, so, if you know, I came in number twenty-four. Yeah, I mean, and I had to, did, yeah. I had to uh, fight for that number twenty-five, and that meant a lot to me, man. Because, uh, hey, yo, he, that shouldn't have happened. You know what I'm saying? That's that's something that shouldn't have happened. And uh, that really just opened my eyes to a lot of stuff. And I just kept it in my mind. Like, if A.O. can sacrifice his life for this game, yeah. I ain't got no excuses. You know what I'm saying? There's no excuses for me to go on. William Moore, number 25, um, uh, you know, probably the last of the big, hard hitting, strong safety, but who had awesome range, really, you know, you know, I'm saying it now, but, you know, we have practice every day, we watch each other every day. I mean, great ball skills, um, make plays on the ball, um, you know, fast, you know, people you know, people look at him and see his size faster than he looked. But I think more game I would definitely say more game speed than, than 
test his speed. Mm-hmm. Even though he, he tests well but on the field, way faster. Um, uh, what I'm gonna say? What I'm gonna talk about with, with this? I got a list. Uh, you know, watching big hits. I'm gonna ask you what your what your favorite big hit is. I'm gonna try to see if we can pull this footage up. We gonna put on it. So I'm looking. I'm looking right now. Big hits. I'm thinking. We look, I'm thinking we playing Carolina one time, and this back in the job of school with Toten. Like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm talking about <laughs> 250 Toten. And, man, you came downhill, bro. All right. No form, dog. Right. All helmet hit this dude. <laughs> boom. Like, crushing. And then I'm thinking about this after I left Atlanta. We play your hometown team, St. Louis, and you suplex. I don't even know what it is. Right. It's probably one that's all over YouTube. Right. I don't even know what he was thinking about. Like, was he trying to hurt him? But like, he, he like, was like half hard and hurt him. Right. And you caught him mid air and you, and you, and you suplexed him. Then, I remember we played AZ. You got one of Larry Fitzgerald on the, on the far, on the, on the far sideline in the corner. Mm-hmm. Also, the game. Then, uh, you got a shirt, you got a shirt on right now. Uh, rest in peace, uh, DT, Demarius Tommy. We I'll played. Make sure uh, y'all get that, man. Yeah, DT. I want to make sure y'all get that. That was um I don't know that was either Sunday night game we this Monday night was a Monday or Sunday night game yeah Monday night we played and, uh, he, it was a touchdown you hit him uh ball Jar, 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 hit Jar the ball his ball came out and I'm trying to think if it's one more one more I can remember I don't know oh my god I don't know what to say I wrote it down nope that was it if it's something else I don't know we probably can find the footage on those. Because you were such an enforcer, which is your biggest hit that you're going to know. We, the stuff you were doing, you can't even do that anymore. No, you can't. No, you can't. That, that's great. You said my, my top two was the first two you named. It was on Jonathan Stewart. And uh, because I was, a, you know, I was deep field. Bro, you had to be like, I'm yes. talking about 20, 20 25, yards, 30, 30 yards right. back. I'm like, right. and people, I, another thing people don't know, like we, they watch on TV, and you might get a little click clack from the pad. Right. And they might watch from the stand. Right, they, right. Really, they still don't know how fast right. we really moving. But you know, on the sideline, you can hear the pitter patter. Mm-hmm. You can do speed start or stop. You can hear. You can feel the heat when people running past you. Right. And then the hits, like they don't really understand how they really sound. Right. You know, they don't understand how they sound like on the sideline level. Um. Right. Yeah. Like, you had everybody. Yeah. Nervous. You had everybody mm-hmm. nervous mm-hmm. to the point. I think Smitty came up and said something. Yeah, to he, did. he did. He said something to you after that. You said that was between that and that, the, and that the, the, the world, WWE right. move right. on right. Buddy from St. Louis. That was all adrenaline, man. That was that was all adrenaline. I think I got up on him too fast to be out from St. Louis. Yeah. I think his name Mike McNeil. Yeah. Uh, he was a tight end. He was in cover three. I had the flats. And um, I think I got up on him so fast that he wanted the hurdle and he wanted to like, run me over. He was just caught in between, not knowing what he was going to do. And that was just adrenaline because I look back at it. He weighed 275 some pounds. I don't know how the hell I picked him up and suplexed him. You know what I mean? But again, that was adrenaline. Yeah. And if I tried it right now, I'd probably break his back. You know what I mean? So, and yeah, we do a lot of stuff out right. there. We like, man, uh-huh. they, they go back and watch the film. Right. All right. So, obviously, we all students of the game. Let's go. Every, every show does it, so we're going to do it too. We're going to be the top five. Top five safeties you think that played, and then after that, who you think you models your game out of, or who you who, what pieces of people's game that they uh, that you model? Top five players that played. You talking about safety? Your top five safety ever? Ever? Yours? Oh, sure. Yours? Not ever? Yeah, yeah, you okay. yeah, for sure. Uh, see, I'm not. I'm one of the people. I don't go off of height. I don't go off of highlights. Yeah. None of that. I go off of straight dogs who I can yeah. look at it like he can fly. Yeah. And uh. One was Eric Berry. I oh, love the way oh, he played. What? I love he everything. I love the way he played. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. He was so quiet with it. You know what I mean? Uh, he was one of the players that I really loved watching. I remember at the Pro Bowl uh, it was the first time me and Eric we really sat down and you know had a conversation and just to you know hear him talk how humble he was. You know what I'm saying? And them the type of players I love who like. They don't do a lot of talking. They let their game speak for them. Uh, so him, of course, Brian Dog is my favorite slave oh, ever. You know, Weapon X. Weapon X, no question. And uh, Troy Palomaro, of course. 
because of his range on the field. Of course, yeah, he had the freedom to do that. Yeah, he never know what he was going to do. Right. I watched film on him a few times. You can't watch You can't watch film on him. He was the deep third safety and ended up coming down on the slant. So, you know, that's the type of stuff he did. And, uh, of course, I like Cam Chancellor. I always like Cam, you know what I mean, for his time in the league. He, he, he was one of the big safeties that made noise. And, uh, Number five. Yeah, the one you missing, it, I'm trying I'm, I'm going to see what you want to say first. Though. I mean, I go way back to Ronnie Lott. So, you know what I mean, Ronnie Lott. I can go all day with them. Them some of my past, present safeties, you know what I'm saying? You miss somebody, though. I mean, I can. I know you miss somebody, but this is this, uh, this, 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 the person you miss is the person they always put at number one. Sean I'm Taylor. Not, Sean Taylor. See, and that's, see, I was going to say Ed Reed. I love Ed Reed. Oh, Ed Reed is, is one of my two, top two, five yeah. safeties, of yeah. course. But, you know, I like to show love to guys who strong and who try to change the game yeah. while we play. That's like Eric Berry and Cam Chancellor. But, um, Ed Reeves for sure, like that's one of my big brothers. Why I played, he mentored me a lot. Yeah. Uh, see, the thing about Sean Taylor, he didn't he didn't have a, a long standing in the league. He was physical. Wow. Real. Yeah. I think he probably wouldn't change. So he just, you know, think so? The reason why I'm gonna say that because I'm I'm from DC. Right. I was in DC when when he right. got there. Yeah, right. I'm gonna tell you like right now, like that dude, they love Sean Taylor. Like, people absolutely when right. I got killed. I mean, like when he got when he got killed, bro, it was like some such a soul out of our city. Even now, right. when you bring up Sean Taylor right now, watching DC, bro, it's like it's like sensitive. They're like, oh man, like a sensitive subject, like really right. a sensitive subject. So that's why it's so hard to put him in my top five. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? It, it, it sounds crazy. It's so hard to put him in my top five due to the short time he played. And we talking football. Right? We're not talking yeah. personal. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Oh, that's football. What you think. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I love, don't get it twisted. I got Sean Taylor jersey. I'm like, I love everything about you know what I'm saying? Sean Taylor. But when you say top five, I like, you know, uh, uh, oh, your career, your resume. You know what I'm saying? He built an uh, incredible resume in a little small time he played. But, you know what I mean? I feel like if he would have played 10, 15 years, he would have been in yeah. Of course. You know what I mean? Okay, so, we, you know, we went back a little bit. So tell me, like, you know, tell me how your life changed after you signed the deal and free agency. Like how the sense of accomplishment. Right. I mean, you know, I had maybe, maybe even maybe I like that a little bit harder because of, you know, some stuff you got to deal with. I mean, I had a sense of accomplishment the second I got drafted, you know what I'm saying? And uh, I knew I had to work extra hard. But when I signed my second deal, it was more like I got a lot more work to do, you know what I'm saying? The level of expectation went up, you know what I mean? And uh, I, that's one thing I pride myself on, like the grind don't stop, you know what I mean? It don't matter what the hell, when I went to the Pro Bowl, I wanted to redo it, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And uh, when I signed, bro, it was, I, I actually cried like a baby when I signed, bro. Like, i never forget that same day. I, I went ball like 10 balls of Ace of Spades. <laughs> I came home and uh, I had a big corbo box full of Ace of Spades and all my childhood friends they were like, the hell you got the dollars uh, champagne for? And I was turning the TV on, and that's what they were talking about. And yeah. everybody in there was talking about, I just started crying, bro. It was like, the shit I've been through, it's been a long journey, you know what I'm saying? Money, the thing about me, money don't determine yeah. my success, you know what I'm saying? Money don't determine like, the job that I'm doing, you know, how far I've come. But it did dictate the work I put in, you know what I'm saying? And that's all it was. So. The time he played, you know, now if you would have, you would have came into the league now, you know, it'd be automatically you would you wouldn't even be playing have played right. safety in college, they would have put you know the movies to line back with the way the game changed. And uh I asked before my answer again now, do you I ain't gonna use the word regret, but do you, you wish you would have made change, you know, toward the end of your career from, you know, being that big safety, maybe come down to playing the wheel back. It wouldn't have been nothing different. Man. I feel like I played linebacker my whole career due to, so, you know, being in the box a lot. And, I mean, I'm giving you my honest opinion, you know. Yeah. You know I don't get cliche answers, you know what I mean, to make it sour, but I hated being in the box, you know what I'm saying? All the time. I love being in the box, but I hated being down there 90% of the time. And, you well, you know what? Tell, tell everybody why. We talk about contract implications. We talk about reduction. So absolutely. You tell people why, you know, being in the box, why you didn't like it. You know, because how limited you 
Right. We're talking about money now, too. Right. We, people can pay it off. I know. We're looking at Will Mo, year three, four. We're looking at he got this many picks, this many, out of tell people why. Right. But sometimes I think, you know, you signed a deal. We see, like, right now, Bill James is signing a huge deal. Like, you know, obviously, that's different now. He oh, signed? Oh, yeah. Man. Highest paid safety ever. Um, like, like 19, like almost 20. Yeah, yeah. Almost 20 years. I mean, he just, he were, he was he he respected as a, you know, one awesome all around player. That's see, all around yeah. second game. Yeah, yeah. the moment. You know, he got, and, and the thing about it is, he kind of played a lot like you. He around the ball, he got, he, you know, he got good ball skills. Um, Awesome range, could run. He's not as big as he was, right. but I mean, really, dare yeah, I say, young game is kind of, kind of the same a little bit. I would, I wouldn't relate myself to Ground James, but uh, I was kind of like Cam Chancellor. But I look at guys like Jamal Adams. You know what I'm saying? I think he had like a bunch of stats, no interceptions, and he wouldn't got paid off of that. You know what I'm saying? Due to they put him in position to make these plays. You know what I'm saying? Let him go sack the quarterback. He had them two interceptions and some shit like that. Yeah. And that's, it just depends on how the game changes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I feel like when I played, I was held back a little bit from being free. You know what I mean? Because yeah, you know you played with me. Uh, when Coach Nolan got there, defensive coordinator Coach Nolan got there. The first year I was in Pro Bowl. And you asked why, because he allowed us to work. Be free. Yeah, he, he said, hey, he said, I'm a scheme to your uh, your best attribute. I want to uh, I want to draw the defense to fit your most um, what you do best. Yeah, what you, do best yeah. you know what I'm saying? So I felt like if I would have had in my whole career, I would have been like my career would have been totally different. Uh, I feel like my stats was good enough for the little time I played. You know, so I have more interceptions than a lot of cats today, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And and I'm big on watching politics, you know what I'm saying? I know how politics work, you know what I mean? I watched a lot of film here today. And um, I watched, I just watched the game uh, from 2012. And there was a lot of times I made some big plays and it just go on to the next one. And I think about Buffalo, we play Buffalo Bills down in Buffalo, uh, down there. and. Uh, the game was, was in overtime. Tight end caught the ball for the game. I punched the ball out. And we picked it up. Matt Bryan kicked the game on the field goal. But who do you think is the board? Mm-hmm. Matt Bryan. You see what I'm saying? And literally, they said nothing about the, the call fumble. You know what I'm saying? Like, I literally punched the ball out to set up the, the game on the field goal, but no one missed it. And I was just like, but I, I'm one of the people. I don't look at accolades. I don't. I don't give a damn about it. No, this was. Uh, this, I don't know. We played five. We played the ball field. So we played Buffalo at home. Yeah. Uh, now this was. Yeah. I don't think you probably. I don't think you oh, was there. Yeah, you wouldn't. Have. Uh, but it's stuff like that, man. That uh, I've dealt with my whole career. You know, I've made a lot of game winning plays that would just you know said just swept under the rug. I don't know for whatever reason. It's just what it is. And that's politics. I feel like I could have been, you know, what I mean, a top safety if uh, you know I would have been hollered a little more because I played in Atlanta. You know what I mean? Yeah. A lot of times I, I didn't go. I had the year I went to the Pro Bowl. I had better stats when I didn't go to the Pro Bowl. Yeah. You understand know what I'm saying? The yeah. only reason I went because Atlanta was winning at the time. Yeah. You know, we, you know, we have we actually won a lot of games there, but you know I think uh, and obviously we had Matt and yeah, Julio. Yeah. Tony, so a lot of, a lot of, you know, and a lot of, I'm just spotlighting the right word, but we had some of the offices. Well, well deserved. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we had, we had great dogs. Yeah. Yeah. We had some dogs, and like, you know, probably two, two Hall of Fame yeah. on the wall. I mean, you know, Riley was led, led the league in receptions right. a couple times. Like, you know, we had a lot of, you know, a lot of awesome players on the team, but not only, you know, and this, you can be, I want you to be as open about this as you want to be. You talk about, you say you know, it was 20 or 30 percent of Will Moore that that we didn't really get to see. Right. Why you why you why, why we was playing? Why you was playing with the Falcons? That's the only team you played for. So right. you feel like the, the organization, your teammates, everybody only got a piece of you. Right. So talk talk about what they didn't get to see. Or what what you what, what, who you wasn't who you sorry, who you wasn't able to be. Part of you wasn't able to live or the truth of yourself that you weren't able to give everybody. I talk mean, about it and why why you play you good. 
I mean, for the most part, I feel like I started to get people made like D Block, you see what I'm saying? Like Freestyle Fridays. Yeah. It's very not often that you see a bunch, you know what I mean? Players like rapping in the league and taking pride in it. I've been rapping since yeah. I was young and it goes back to the time when we didn't have lights in the house. Now you're sitting there and, you know what I'm saying? I have a little flashlight and I'm sitting there writing raps, you know what I'm saying? That's how much pride I take in music. I've always loved music. But when I got to the league, I really, you know what I mean? It's only, I remember, I don't want to say the coach's name, but uh, we was undefeated at this time. And we was on Freestyle Friday. It was all good when we were doing it. Like, it was like, oh, the team camaraderie is coming together. Oh, everybody loved me. Like, but the next year, we damn near went eight games. We lost straight. And I remember coach saying, we're going to cut. I remember walking in there one Friday. They said, we, coach said, we can't do Freestyle Friday no more. I said, why? They said, it's a distraction. They said, it's a distraction. I said, last year when we went, they said it was, you know what I mean, to read like a good part of the team we had yeah. together. Now all of a sudden we're losing, I'm a distraction from rapping, you know what I mean? Oh, you worried about rapping and boot the boot, you know what I mean? And I feel like moments like that put me in a position like I just won't say nothing, you know what I'm saying? Like I just felt like, you know what I mean? Because you, you, you see guys in the NFL, um, I don't even want to say they acting, but you see guys who fit the image of oh, in the community, doing yeah, this you know, A lot of it is a game. Some real dudes in the league that's real genuine, but it is a lot of people who kind of play the role. Yeah. And sometimes if that person is facing a franchise, they got to do it. You know what I mean? Respectfully, Respectfully right. right. But then, you know, you got people who come in and they're not being themselves. Right. And then when you find out what they got going on at home, like, damn. It's shocking, yeah, right? It's shocking to a lot of people. people. Right. Like, like this in the locker room, we didn't right. even know he had that habit right. going on. Right. And, and off camera, we talk about it, but you don't want to expose about it. But just, you can't, you can't get caught up in that because obviously the shield, then you know, there's an opportunity, um, opportunity we have, you know, the money we're able to make. But then, there's some people might not be as secure. Like, I'll be honest. Like, you know, you you walk in a locker room, you sign. You know, for what, I forgot what you sign for. You sign for whatever you sign for. You good. Somebody else walking there, they gotta walk a straight and narrow. Right. They gotta do that. They gotta right. yes or no sir. You know what I'm saying? To, um, you know, really stay on the team and make sure their family. And I kind of that kind of take away the meritocracy part. Cause now you really do feel like you're happy. So you gotta come there every day, be happy. Not somebody might be playing, somebody with a big contract might be playing in front of somebody that Absolutely. we all know probably should be playing. Right, right. But, you know, in locker, we know who should be playing, but it don't, it don't work like that all the time. But, right. um, but yeah, uh, I definitely can see. But you know what, though? I probably feel like we we got you was who I thought we thought you was. I mean, because I mean, yeah, because we saw, you know, I'm be real. When you step on the field, nobody never know. But it be some days you come like, damn, I don't know if Bo's gonna make it. We're gonna make it today. He look tired, but still, when you get out on the field, you do what you gotta do. You know what I'm saying? You was like, it was funny. I heard a quote on um, a couple, was it when Raheem Morris was uh, mm -hmm. was in it? Mm -hmm. They was talking about, um, you know, Kyle Wood. They was talking about, he kind of like a rapper. I'm like, man, you must have hit him with Morris. Right. This, <laughs> this dude had three, four old schools. Yeah. You know, we go out, you know what I'm saying? He might for the party, getting everything together, you know what I'm saying? We doing a freestyle Friday. I'm like, I really thought, like, I it was, the, 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 the good thing about it was that, you know what I'm saying? We so different, but we still the brother. We still, we still the same. I'm like, yeah, Mo. I'm like, he's like the side of me that I wish I, I like. I wish I could be a little bit or the life. I, you know, what I'm saying I, I wish I could live. I, I know I couldn't do it or whatever. Right. But uh, we really felt like everybody felt like they knew Will Mo. I mean, but you I wish you what would. But at the yeah, same time. when you say when you say it's thirty percent that we ain't get, all right, <laughs> what, what, what we miss? Right. I mean, it's a lot. You know, obviously, you saw the game. I had a grill, and I used to work gold teeth, top and bottom, but nobody do. When I get in the locker room, the coach come and be like, "You going you gonna wear a grill this, this week?" I be like, "Yeah, why? I don't think you should wear it." And I'll be like, "Why not?" You know what I'm saying? And at that point, I was like, "Damn, it's, you know what I, mean? I felt offended." A coach come to me that I somebody who I look at like, you know what I mean? Tell you to be that yourself, but I come to you and be like, "I don't think you should wear that grill this week." I'm like, why the hell should I wear my gold grill? That's who I am. You know what I'm saying? And that's the stuff that came back from really like 
being myself, when I say myself, I don't feel like I can perform at my highest level because I'm worried about dumb shit behind. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know? We most crazy on on especially like playing defense. You know, we more reactive players, and uh, you know, there's some stuff that we got to do that probably most people won't do. A three hundred pound offensive lineman, he, you know, outweigh you by right. 60, 70 pounds, right. running from thirty yards deep. Yeah. You know, attack somebody full head steam. You know, you kind of got to be a savage a little bit. You got to. You got to be a savage, but. It can't, you know, it can't spill over. All so as, soon, as soon as you walk in the locker room, it's all right, little sad, little hit the switch. It's, I've it's always gone. said that about a lot, of NFL, a lot of football players in general were more NFL players because we get paid. Yeah. Uh, they train us to be pit bulls, but when you leave it, don't bite nobody. You know what I'm saying? And I've always said that. So it goes back to what you said. You train, in practice, you you, you train us to be these, these dogs and warriors, but when you get home, a guy, you know, you know, I don't condone any domestic violence, but you know, some guys go home and they get into it with their wives and you read about it on the on the on the news and stuff, and now you look like, holy snaps, where this come from? You just train this guy to be, you know what I'm saying? You train these guys this guy been trained since he was young to be a dog. You know what I'm saying? And don't take no shit. You know what I mean? And I'm not even domestic violence probably is the worst example, but that's just an example like coming home and it's hard to turn the switch off. Yeah. And what I'm saying is like guys go to my great example is like guys go to a bar and somebody come behind them that's drunk talking shit. You train this guy to, you know what I'm saying, body slam people who, you know what I'm saying, have some aggression, like have some balls and you know what I'm saying, defend yourself and go out there and don't let don't take no shit from nobody. But when you go to this bar you post them. You know what I mean? Let this guy talk crazy to him to walk off. And that's what you're asking people to do. But a lot of these guys are ready for whatever at all times. You know, what some people, some people can do it, some people can't. I, I mean, everybody can do it. Yeah, it just take that one time when you just like fuck this shit. Like I've had enough. You know what I'm saying? So what part of that you feel like you had you had to uh, you had to cover? I mean, just I don't know what I'm saying. Like you don't raise up out the chair when you talk about that. <laughs> I mean, me personally, like I told you earlier. I have my God parents, you know what I'm saying? And I'm really respectful on the stuff that I've always allowed them to see. And you know what I'm saying? Um, that goes a lot to my friends that I've had in high school, you know what I mean? They didn't tell me not to hang around with certain people, yeah. but they are like, tell me like, oh, I like him, he's a good kid. That's they saying, they don't like him, you know what I mean? And, I'm, and so I have to like, not hang around him in front of them. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and I just didn't like that. And I did just take away from who, like, who I really was. And, I, and I'm a great judge of character, you know what I'm saying? I can hang around the most savage people, but I don't have to be the savage, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, that, and, that, and that goes a lot to what I said about the lead, you know what I mean? I want to be me. And my question to everybody was, how many guys other than Dion that you see in the Hall of Fame that's gold teeth and, you know what I'm saying? It's a big deal on Allen Ops. Why well, is it a big deal him, on Allen Ops? Him, him, him and Edge. Him and Edge, is it? I mean, he made it is shitty that he went through taking his grill out. You know what I'm saying? The whole stuff about that. You know what I'm saying? And just the stuff on like Allen Ops. Why was it a big Why was it a big stuff? Why was it a big deal? You know what I'm saying? From from Allen Ops and wearing cornrows and well, you how he dressed. Image, image of the lead. They trying to, you know, they trying to. No, protect. I respect trying, it. I mean, I, you ask me why I'm right. telling you, they trying to protect. But you getting kids protect. from the hood. You Getting kids from the hood, though. Mm -hmm. You understand? You getting kids yeah. that come from nothing, and I understand you asking them to, to respect the shield and, and dress a certain way. But at the same time, that's not that's them not being themselves. You understand what I'm saying? I, mean, I get it, but you know, at the end of the day, every kid getting plug out of the hood ain't signed for thirty, and it ain't right. It's just one of the, it's like it's one of the things like. You shouldn't have to be different, but you know, they this thing this you, thing bigger than both of us, you know. Right. They're gonna be dead and gone and the right. league is still gonna be gone. But so you see how it evolved though, right? You see how it evolved. Like as far as them accepting, like now, you know what I'm saying, people oh, yeah, they don't, a lot more freedom. Absolutely. And why do you think that's for? Well, people who pay the way. You know, it's always gonna be, always gonna be a martyr on it's always gonna be a martyr on the way to, on the way to change. I mean they got they can do a, a whole lot more stuff. Like this one. Wearing a certain kind of cleats, 
You talking about taking a, a fine, five grand for some right. now that you know. Just tell the wrong way. So I mean, it, it means things evolve, things have changed. The people that before us probably said the same thing about us. So right. We just was, we just born a little too early. I mean, you can look at it this way. <laughs> Who do you think these kids idolize, man? When you when these kids, you know, what I'm saying, watching their favorite athletes on TV, but when they finally well, meet them and they're not this guy who they thought they was. Well, that's a whole other story. Man. Nah, that's the same story. Boy, you know what I'm saying? Like, say not what they thought they was. I mean, I, you know, I can only. It's kind of, sometimes we should view the world through, you know, from us, but um, you know, just being a professional. You know, it's just sometimes even even if it's like we're not playing football, even if it's like we work on a corporate job, we can't work. We can't walk into the office, and you know we might not be able to say like we have even this conversation we have now. Like it's open, but it's some stuff that might probably get said off camera. But we can't walk into the office and just be our true self. It's like you know a little bit of etiquette, a little bit of decorum you gotta have. But is it right? But no. Why? But again, as an employee of that professional. Organization that you're trying to be in. Why would you want to be an employee that you can't be yourself? That's my biggest question. Like, because is that's that for I'm money, right? Say money. I mean, we yeah. we know it's money. It's yeah, second right. and money. And that's, it has a lot to do with my retirement. I didn't want to play anymore because I had lost the love for it due to the business part. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I used to cry before every game, bro. And I, you know what I'm saying? Not intentionally shed tears like, oh, uh, like, but before every game. I zone out and get my mind right, and I find myself reflecting on what I've been through to get to where I met. And I shed tears, and I find myself literally born, you know what I'm saying? Every game. But later in my career, like year six, year seven, I remember listening to songs, and I'm hyped for the game. And I remember Coach coming to me and said, you ain't ready yet. I said, what you mean, Coach? He said, you ain't ready yet. Because I was up playing, joking around and stuff. He said, you ain't ready yet. And that's when I realized, like, my love for the game is, like, not, you know what I'm saying? I didn't take it as serious as that I usually did. So what you, what, you, what do you wish you could have shown everybody? So we had to do a, we, we back in the limo again, headed back. What's, what, what, what part of you wish you, you could have shown? Wish I know, wish, wish that I know now. Um, I look at Marshawn Lynch. You see, they couldn't stop Marshawn Lynch. Marshawn was who he was. Yeah, what did they do with that? They took it and flipped it and made it. Money like, off of it, Made money off of it, but they made it like a, a marketing thing, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Marshawn don't give a damn, you know what I'm saying? It's a lot of players in the league that's like Marshawn, but they they don't have Marshawn money, so they got to have like something else. He's so smart. He's so and that dude really. You know, Marshawn didn't he intentionally do that. Well, Marshawn was the hell no. Marshawn, I, 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 I think I think he did. No, it came about, but Marshawn just being himself, and he was so good at what he did that people, you know what I'm saying? Like Marshawn eating Skittles. For the game and some shit. Like, he didn't know he was going to get a Skittle contract or some shit like that. He just was, you know what I mean? He liked eating Skittles. If he would have went out there and got, and fumbled the ball five times, they would have told him, stop eating fucking you know, Skittles. We know that. Man. I mean, that's just what I know what I'm saying. We know he, he's an awesome player. You know what I mean? That's all that was. He's awesome. He's awesome. He's awesome. He's awesome. He's like one of the best guys we've seen. And okay. I don't know. I, you know I don't, know what, I, don't know, I don't know what the statistics say, but we know we turn the film, right. film on the beast mode. Right, right, right. We know all right, he won the best match we've seen. Now, obviously, you know, some of the stuff that he, him being himself was tied to, you know, his performance on the field. Performance on the field, but. That made a lot of stuff acceptable. Yeah, right. that's. Yeah, that's that's, that's what everything don't go. But that's the whole point. Like, a lot of players that don't get that leeway because they don't. They, they, not that they don't perform, they just don't get the spotlight that some players well, I mean, Let's be real. It's been some stuff we were playing that you could have got away with, that I couldn't have got away with. Because I was of what was going on. Because, I mean, the impact you was having. Not because who, I shouldn't have or what up, but when Sunday came, your, your impact was big. Okay, life. but let's keep it a buck, though. You didn't get the opportunities that I had to go make the impact. Yeah, we know that. So, so that, they got a lot to do we'll, with it. Let's take that for another podcast. Yeah, the oldest brother passed. High school friend passed. You got the um, DC shirt on, and another jersey in the wall. Thomas Alvey came after to the five with another left. Um, you know, somebody you talk about your man, cool with, close with. Um, yeah, he passed. And obviously, um, you know, I didn't know, but just watching on social media, yeah, you got a chain on right now. I say casino mode. Um, I want you to. 
talk about that. Talk about your friend, um, what he meant to you, and then let you know, let the world know what you want. What you want everybody to know about your friend um, and what he meant to you. What you then basically what you want everybody to know about. Uh, Castino mode actually come from two of my homeboys that died. One name was Castine Bridges, and the other name was Fontino. So I put it together, Castino. Uh, Tino died first. Tino was uh, he he went to school down college down there in Tennessee. So he's right down the road. He used to come back in and you know, see me every weekend. But I met Tino through Castine. Castine was my college roommate. And uh, man, me and Dude and several, man, that was my, my brother, brother, like best friend, you know what I'm saying? And um, so Tino, I gotta say, he was a real good kid, man. I ain't gonna say kid, but a real good dude, man. And uh, just unfortunately, he went back home, back in Cali. In, in the wrong place, wrong time, you know what I'm saying? So he went to go visit his grandma and he just hang on the block. And, you know, he didn't know the, the issues going on in the hood. And somebody came from shooting. He was just out there hollering at his people. About all people, he got hit, you know, and he died, man. And um, it really touched me and Castine. And uh, with Castine, you know, he, he always was in a dark place. You know, Castine, he, he played uh, football down in Missouri with me. And, uh, I think a lot of it has to do with CTE, you know what I'm saying, mental illness. But he was like that, you know, after that me and his mom had some conversations, but he was in dark places his whole life. But I think a lot of it was, he was a real physical cornerback. Yeah. And uh, I think that had a lot to do with it. But Castine, uh, he was the life of the party everywhere we went, man. He often uh, joked about death a lot, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, I wasn't okay with that, so I called him out on it a lot. So it got to the point that, uh, like, later in, you know, between his, his days of dying, he, uh, he used to go to social media a lot and talk about death, like, openly, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, when I die, this and that, you know, he'd joke about it. And uh, he hated when I'd be like, I call him, like, bro, take that down, you know what I mean? So he'd, he'd try to dodge me. But the casting, he got in a real dark place at the end of his days. He actually flew to Vegas by himself, and he went out there and he took his life. He shot himself. He took his life by himself, and that place was uh, it takes a huge toll on me because I often think about his last seconds. You know what I'm saying? Because uh, I love that dude a lot, man. I know he loved me to death. But he had uh, two beautiful twin daughters that they won't have a father. But he was going through something a little deeper than anything any of us can possibly imagine, you know what I'm saying? And I, I think that was one of the club. I, that was the second best friend I lost. When my childhood best friend died. He was, he was that much with me. He had just got the penitentiary and he ended up moving to Missouri with me. So I lost two of my best friends, man. And, uh, that definitely got me in a place that mentally I don't think I ever come back from. I went through depression, and that was the first time that I realized like I'm no different than nobody else. You know what I'm saying? Them days of sitting in a room, a dark room, uh, by myself, going through depression, man. That's when I realized like this shit real, man. Yeah. So what? It's funny you said that. I'm about to ask you because what he even told me uh, so he was asking my like, talk about six people that died that was close to me in about an hour. I, how you doing with that? Where you at mentally? How you carry it? How you doing anything to, you know, to uh, number one process through it healthy in a healthy manner? Are you, are you speaking to someone that maybe you see a therapist to kind of deal with it? Because you know, I can tell you, uh, my father passed after after I left Atlanta. I went to Indianapolis, I and my father passed away. And bro, it's I ain't gonna lie, it took me about five, six, five or six years to. I mean, to deal with that. And you, I mean, still, this is my dad. And you talking about a brother, close friend. You know, our close friends, they like, right. they just like them. Absolutely. I mean, this, this ain't just no cliche because I ain't, this episode, you know, when this episode here, the second episode I have is me and my therapist sat down, my counselor sat down, we talked about some stuff. We couldn't go too deep into everything because you got hip violations. It's like, you go to the doctor, you got a sign, you can talk about everything. 
Now, have you went and talked to somebody? You got a confidant? You got somebody you see? Or do you, do you think you need to go see somebody? Just kind of deal with it. It's a lot, bro. And, you know, losing people close to you, it, it's hard. It's hard, bro. Man, I'm going to keep up me. I'm going to always keep it a buck with you, bro. And uh, me, the place I'm in right now, uh, I'm mentally, like, fucked up. You know what I'm saying? And that's just honestly speaking. But uh, I think my children has uh, overcome all that. You know what I'm saying? They, they're my comfort. You know what I'm saying? Like, just the smile on my kid's face definitely let me know that there's more important things, you know what I'm saying, to worry about. But... You know, come with uh, with success is it's not drawing up how people think. You know, what I'm saying with money it comes with a lot of other shit. You know what I mean? So basically, with money is it's limited people that I can talk to. You know what I'm saying? Cause if it ain't about money, it ain't about nothing. You know what I mean? So uh, I've learned to deal with a lot of stuff that I've been through. I carry on my shoulders very well. You know what I'm saying not privately, and I commend myself. On I can, I can carry it on my shoulders and use this motivation, you know what I'm saying? But mentally, I often think about it a lot, you know what I mean? I've lost so many people that's just been sitting right here, you know what I mean? Talking, and, you know what I mean? Talking about the future and they're no longer here, you know what I mean? But I use that as one day we all gotta leave, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's guaranteed, we all leave here, bro. Ain't no if in the bus. So that's the positive side of looking at it. Like, we all have a day. It don't have to be a dark time to think about it. You know what I'm saying? We all have to leave. But I, I know I need to sit down and talk to someone, but my trust level is very, very low. Well, I tell you right, this, this is a perfect conversation to have when I got somebody. You know, we don't talk enough. This ain't going to be for camera. I got some. I'm going to give you another. As soon as we can get down with this, you going to have a number to take. She ain't want to shoot the truth. Um, not even, you know, from a, just a natural sense. She got to get from God. So now that you, you know, you say that, but you know, the one thing that had discouraged me from talking to someone, I went to the Philippines, I think it was 2017, so I worked there. I went to the Philippines on a missionary trip, and uh, it was a lady, she's a, um, she's a therapist. She was actually on the boat with us. And as I sit there, we was talking about it therapy session and she was like excited that you know she got on vacation. She was like, who oh, wants to sit down and have to sit in there with these crazy patients? And she said, oh, you couldn't imagine she was just talking along and I'm listening. And they go to show you you don't know who you is. Yeah. So she said, uh, you couldn't imagine these crazy stories that people come in here and give off, et cetera, et cetera. I, I wouldn't let that discourage you though. You know, the reason why is because a lot a lot of people do a lot of stuff and it's like they don't mean they call to do it. Absolutely. Like we got a bunch of people we know who play a game of football who just did it. Right. I mean, they just did it because hey, they might have been felt pressure, so they might have just needed the money. Right. Or, you know, people play all kind of reasons. Be cool and be serious on your way. But you know we got some people who really, you know, whether they become a Hall of Famer or they just play a year or two, they playing because they really love it. I'm telling you this person do this thing because she really got to give and she really love it, bro. Now, I'm going to tell you that, so I'll tell you word. Yeah. Like, I mean, you know, you can trust me. We're we going we gonna, we gonna to get y'all some stuff. But I know, and this is probably the part that I'm most excited about because, you know, they got this thing where they say athletes want to be rappers and rappers want to be entertainers. But so the first time I found out this dude rap, it's like, man, you know, I, I know I can rap, but most, most people are like, I, you know, another another app is saying can rap. But Mo really got a gift, and I know, but I see, I know his music. Just like when you play, even listen to the music then. I told you back then, I, I told you you sound like pop. Even now, we listen to some stuff. Now, I'm like, dang, this dude, we got this, you know, the sound still sound like pop with his own twist, but you you feel pop when you listen to it. And um, I know this one right now, since we ain't playing but we can't go out with this hit, you know, hit legally no more. Right. I know you're channeling a lot of the stuff into it. I heard some of the tracks you got. This year. You always say you've been doing music since you was young, but talk about, talk about your love, your love. Not just, you know I mean? I know everybody want to rap. Some people doing it, uh, trying to make money. But for what I know, 
you ain't made no serious money off yet. I think you, I think you are, but tell me about just your love, your love for the art, your love, you know, love for art form, love for the music, and how you know you put your experience and what you feel on wax. What, what, what's that like? You know, I was rapping before I even started ever test the ball. You know what I'm saying? I used to think I could rap wax. Anybody from where I'm from, uh, I've been doing since I was young. And that's just the way I, like I said, I turn my, my, my energy and I put a lot of passion into it from uh, what I've been through, what I'm going through. And I really take it seriously because it's like, that's my therapy session, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, do I love the fact that, you know, you go from athlete to rapper, it's the most challenging thing ever. Nobody gonna take you serious, you know what I'm saying? And that's really like the, that's really like the worst part of doing music because nobody, they, nobody gonna do you take you serious, you know what I'm saying? So, until, until some stuff happened, then they like, oh yeah, no, no, no. Right. And, like, I really feel like I, you know, I was called to do that, you know what I'm saying? Um, as far as that's my way to talk to people, it's several times people have listened to my song and come back and be like, bro, like, that song got me through a lot, you know, stuff like that. And I'd be like, damn, I never know, like, I can have an impact on people. I thought football would have an impact on people. Yeah. But, you know, I just, because I know you, the right. first song I heard, I think the first song, I don't know what's the name of it, <laughs> it ain't war. No, I'm gonna ask you, well, let me ask you now. You got a song, War. You got a tattoo on you. I know, I know War means Willie Maul always ready. What War really mean? Willie Maul always ready. David, why? What, what, made, what made you come to, to make that statement? I'm always ready, man. It's self explanatory, man. I'm always ready, man. Like, that's just me. I'm always ready. Whatever you like, like just, just groom you to be there. Yeah, I'm always ready. You know, and I feel like, like you have to be. You know what I mean? So it ain't no question. I, I, when I made this statement, it's really like. Yeah, you know, that's what, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. so. <laughs> um, I remember Matt Ryan saying this. Uh, we were at a thing for the team. It was like a little dinner thing. Got the team together. And he said, uh, yeah, probably, when we go to war, I know one. One person I go to war with, and he looked at me and was like, I know you're going to be ready, you know what I mean? And I thought about that, I was like, damn, he must know what war really means, and that's just what it stands for. Like, I'm always ready, like, you know what I mean? I, anybody who I love and I trust, I go to war for them any day, you know what I mean? And that's just what it is. So. And of course, football, I feel like you ain't got to hype me up, you know what I'm saying? Well, I ain't going to lie. Well, so what people don't know, I think uh, one thing I will say about playing for the Falcons, we got a game day atmosphere that ain't like there's no there's no other stadium for like sure. uh, you know they really embrace hip hop yeah, culture. Yeah, yeah. And I remember I don't know when it was. Cause I was trying to think about the first time I heard the song. I'm like, did you play in the locker room? Or was out of practice one day. I think Smitty had finally Smitty like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I can I was sitting on the way home. I'm like, dang, I'm gonna ask him this. I'm like. Was it in the locker room or was it at practice? But when well, you played it and you pretty shouted out everybody, you know, everybody locker that was that, that was on the board. That was on Yeah, board. I know. But then I did three versions of board. But hold on, hold on, I'm gonna get to it though. We doing a pregame and the junk came on before the game. Oh, and jump was on it. Pretty much always oh, right. Man, I ain't gonna lie. And it, it, it's one of the moments where like you just man, maybe talking about it right now. Yeah. Talking about it and, 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 and ain't just gonna get it. I think it might have been we played what we played Denver. I, don't, I can't remember that Peyton Manning game we played Denver might have been. We, we I have first, no idea. Who I don't know, but like, I know it was. I had chills, man, when I heard it come on in the uh, Jumbo Tron in the Hope Stadium. I was just like, wow, like you know what I'm saying. I think it's probably the only place where a team would play the players' sure. song before the right. game, bro. But well, look, bro, Mo. Man, you know, you my brother, dog. I love you, man. Appreciate you coming to sit down and, and man, allow us to see your house and the space and really in your element, bro. Because, like, you know what I'm saying? It's just, this is so organic. You know, we need a studio. I know you probably spent a lot of time here, probably more time you probably should have when you was playing. But right. that, is good, that is the thing. Man, appreciate you sitting down with me. I love you, dog. And that's why I thank you for just, man, allowing me to come in and, and blessing the Zena with your presence. Uh,
steps. Five steps to the grieving process. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's the problem. If you yeah. can't, you don't get time to grieve because somebody else died. Yeah. That's when Saxon's lost the homie, me and him. I met through him. Yeah. And me and him got tight. You know what I'm saying? He, and you, you hear me, Wolf? That's, that's what I lost the homie. I met through him. He used to be able to, he used to have the same dice in his hand. It was just me and him shooting Damn. dice. It's my guy. He get killed. It's crazy. We in the studio, me, him, and the homie. I said, hey, bro, do this song. Do this song with me. My wife do it later. Nah, bro, do it now, bro. And he was like, why are you trying to rush me to do it? I said, bro, it's my promise. He didn't tell you. We'll tell you, bro. These words come from me, bro. That, the first song he played on his computer, that was the song that he was supposed to put a verse on. He never got a chance to put it on there, bro. And he called me right before he died, bro. Like, literally, he called me. I missed his phone call, called him back, he didn't pick up. He was dead, bro. Like, and I think about it all the time. Damn, what if I'm gonna pick the phone up? He supposed to went out, you know what I'm saying? It's crazy, bro. It's crazy. Yeah. Just that fast, bro. We had one time. Black. Yeah. He got killed. Yeah. yeah. Like it was crazy how it happened, bro. I'm talking about like crazy. He just called me, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. I missed the phone call. He would have left, you know what I'm saying? I probably would have said, pull up over here, he probably would have dipped out. I know he would. And he just got killed right on the spot, like, peace, 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 peace. And it's just like, damn, bro, like. Come on.